doing the exact introduction that I had planned, so I'm going to go right into the merits of the general fund. Uh, the general fund is our main operating fund. Almost all the services we provide are paid for out of the general fund. Uh, we, our long-range planning team, have prepared a very detailed report, which is online, and hard copies are available here. You'll find a wealth of information about trends and issues affecting the general fund, and it does provide you a, a great background. Um, I want to thank Allison and everybody on that team for preparing a document that is detailed and also very easy to read and easy to understand. Can I just stop for a second? I think that's uh, far too modest. This is a terrific document. It's very easy to read. It contains a great deal of information in an easy, digestible fashion. And whether you've been doing this for one week or 12 years, it's a terrific document. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm going to jump right to sort of the heart of the issue uh, that is uh, summarized in that document. I'm going to use this visual A. This is a graph of our general fund revenues and expenses dating back to 2007 here on the left-hand side as you look at it, uh, out to last year and into this year, 2014. The uh, total revenues are shown on the blue line, and the total expenses in the general fund are shown on the orange or yellow line here. And what you'll find in looking at this graph is in the mid to late 2000s, we had a situation where expenses were exceeding revenues, and we were not alone in that. That is the onset of the recession. And then you see the lines come together where revenues and expenses are about the same in 2009 and 2010. And that is the product of a restructuring, our first uh, initiation of long-range planning where we, we made a concerted effort to restructure the general fund and make very difficult decisions to right the ship so that we could enjoy a period that we've been enjoying since 2011 where revenues, the blue line, were exceeding expenses. That's where you want to be. And we've enjoyed great success, and the keys to those success are outlined in that document. But here's the issue. When you take a closer look at these lines, you'll notice that the revenue line in blue is flattening. And yet, the, the uh, expense line is growing at a pretty steady pace. Not a huge rate because we've done a great job of bending that cost curve. Here's the concern. You can see physically as these lines move out that they look like they might cross again in the future that we might be headed towards another situation where revenues won't keep pace with increasing expenses. Why? On the expense side, we've identified three key drivers. What is causing our expense line to continue to increase? As we've talked about it many times, we're, we are a customer service organization, and it's people, people that work here at the village that provide those services. So it's logical that personnel-related expenses are the vast majority of our costs, especially in the general fund, over three-quarters of our costs. And so with that, there are three components of personnel expenses that have been increasing and are likely to, to continue to increase. And they are here on the board. Number one, the cost of public safety pensions are increasing. They have been increasing over the past several years. They are expected to increase in the future. There's quite a bit of detail on this issue in the report. The second key driver of expenses going forward is continued uh, increases in health benefit costs. Like all employers, the Village of Downers Grove uh, provides health benefits to our employees. But those costs have been increasing. They are expected to continue to increase. And the third point, uh, salary costs are increasing. Um, in the aggregate, in the last several years, uh, we've had uh, an, we've had experience where the salary costs in, in the total have not been increasing very much. Because in that time frame, we've actually reduced our staffing by close to 15 percent, and we've had a lot of newer employees that have come in at lower pay grades than the more experienced employees. Um, so while the salary costs in the last several years have been very very flat, uh, we expect to see salary costs begin to increase. Uh, because we don't foresee us at this point continuing to reduce staffing levels. So the three key drivers of the expense line, public safety pension costs, health benefit costs, and salary costs. Now on the revenue side, there are three issues that are causing uh, that line to stay flat or not grow as much as we like. Uh, the first we've identified is that income tax revenue may be reduced. Income tax revenue, also referred to as the Local Government Distributive Fund, or LGDF, 
Uh, it's actually a revenue source that has been growing quite well in the last couple of years. The risk here is that uh, through an action of the General Assembly, the amount of state income tax paid into the state uh, may be reduced. The, rem the amount that we receive could be reduced. And so that revenue source is at risk. <coughs> Second issue is also related to potential action uh, by the General Assembly, and that is uh, our property tax revenue may be frozen. Uh, Mayor Tully mentioned this earlier in the evening, uh, that there's actually a proposal at the state level to put a two-year or longer property tax freeze, which would limit and, and could uh, take away our ability to increase property tax levy for operations to keep pace with rising costs. And the third issue is that when you look at sales tax revenue, one of our largest revenue sources, about 25% of our general fund, uh, in the last several years coming out of the Great Recession, it's grown quite a bit. Uh, but in the last year, the, the change between 2013 and 2014 was only about 1%, and there are signs that uh, sales tax revenue will continue to be flat. And there are some particular challenges uh, with sales tax revenue uh, related to Downers Grove that are outlined in that report. So the three key drivers that uh, threaten our growth and our revenue is that our income tax revenue could be reduced, our ability to adjust and raise property tax levy for operations could be frozen, and sales tax revenue, one of our largest revenue sources, is growing at a very slow rate. That was a very, very brief overview, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the mayor and the council. We can do a couple of things. Staff is prepared tonight to answer any questions you may have about the report at any level of detail, and we're also happy to help facilitate a conversation on any one of these issues. Mayor? Thank you. Just to add a few things to what Dave said, uh, additional level of detail, with respect to the municipal share of the state income tax of the local government distributed fund, or LG, LGDF, um, it has been growing, but mind you, it's been increased by the General Assembly, but the municipal share has not kept pace with it because we've been carved out of it. Uh, so, for example, when it was increased to 10 percent, uh, our share of that did not also increase. Uh, it was frozen at what it was in the past. And now, not only has, has uh, not only have we not been allowed to participate in the increases that the state has effected, effectuated for itself, uh, there are threats to uh, take back, if you will, as much as 50 percent of that, which I think in our documentation annually, 100 percent would be about $4.8 million. 50%, uh, which has been proposed multiple times, would be about $2.4 million per year uh, in, in reduced revenue. The other thing that's probably worth knowing is with respect to the proposed property tax freeze, uh, that legislation has actually been put forward onto the uh, floor of the General Assembly on more than one occasion. Uh, there's a lot of politics going on, uh, and, and none of it has passed. Uh, there have been different versions of it in terms of when it would go into effect, uh, maybe two years from now is the current one. And then there's some discussion as to whether there would be any exclusions from it. And that's important because the uh, primary way in which we pay for our public safety pension funds is through property tax levies. And it's not clear whether that freeze would exclude or include uh, levies for public safety pension funds that we're obligated to, to make. Um, but if there's a freeze put on it, then we'd have to make the payment, yet not have the source from which to make the payment. And added to any of these other problems, such as the reduction in revenue, could be a real, a real issue for us. Nobody really knows where this is going, and uh, all we're doing is, is like everybody else, speculating what's going to happen. But I just want to add that additional level of detail to those two aspects um, of what uh, uh, Manager Fieldman <coughs> mentioned. And I would be remiss, Mayor, part of my interruption, that I, I neglected to summarize the solutions and strategies. Not only does the staff prepare a document address, uh, identify issues, we actually have some strategies and solutions that we've proposed uh, that we should, in some cases, continue to utilize. Um, and there's also a couple of new ones. I will not go through them here. They are on the whiteboard. They are also in the summary table of the document. Many of these items are familiar to the council members and staff members. And just to pick up on those, and I, I, I did that just all long enough, so you remember to cover the solutions. The, um, th there's obviously some questions I have on, on those broad topics of strategies, I mean, increase operating efficiencies. Of course, we always want to do that, but uh, you know, we, we have some real specifics in terms of the expense side, a lot of which is out, our, out of our control. On the solutions and strategies, some of the, many of these things are within our control, um, but I think we probably need to know more about what we're thinking realistically they might be, and maybe tonight's not the time to do that. 
but what additional increase in operating efficiencies could we do that would have a material impact upon our expenses? Uh, obviously, reducing personal expenses. I, I know one way to do that, which is not very attractive. Partnering with others is a huge uh, way to go about uh, cutting costs and increasing efficiencies. And I know we're looking at different opportunities, but I think just generally speaking, folks would want to get some idea of what do you mean by that and, and how would that work? Uh, the easiest way to do that would be to look backwards to the combination with Westmont regarding a 911 call center and how that increased operating efficiencies and uh, save each organization several hundred thousand dollars a year going forward. That's a great op uh, advantage of what could be done short term that would deliver that kind of outcome. Enhancing the revenue base, uh, we always strive to do that. And, and, and I know there have been some suggestions about working with the EDC to increase the sales tax base. Um, and if there are particular things that to, to we can do to overcome some of the challenges that have prevented that, such as not having a space to put in a big box retailer that we would love to have in order to generate some of the revenue that other communities do, or um, having uh, ownership issues that deal with some of the large commercial areas that we can't, absent um, more extreme measures, take control of. Um, those are the kind of things that uh, sound good in the abstract, but you know, what, do they, what do they mean? And oftentimes, a lot of those efforts have a long horizon before they start to hit your balance sheet. Um, you know, obviously, the monitor state actions protect village revenues. We would do that anyway. Maintaining a strong fund balance, I guess the question there is, do you change your policy on what our reserves are? Uh, but that's only a short-term solution. So I guess my question in going through all those are, um, and my question for, I guess, the rest of the council too would be, are, are there specific points under some of those broad categories that if folks have questions or comments about? One thing just going down to consider, and this goes back to years ago, I mean, changing service levels, obviously we can have a conversation about that. Increasing property tax for operations, I think everybody understands what that would be. It's an increase in the property tax levy. Adjustments to existing revenue sources and adoption of new revenues. Um, I think the question we've asked in the past, so this isn't anything new, uh, with respect to existing revenue sources, we always ask the question of how do our existing rates, if you will, match up to other communities, and typically this comes up in the context of the sales tax. Uh, what, what are the towns around us doing? Are we even behind? Where are we at? Not suggesting we're adding, raising any, but just for information purposes, knowing where we're at. Same with some of the other um, utility taxes that we have. How do we compare to our neighbors? I realize that increases to utility taxes often have the, adverse of the opposite effect. The more expensive it becomes, the usage goes down, and then you end up defeating the purpose of the increase. Uh, but those are the kind of things that, to even consider them properly, um, I'd want to have that additional information. And adoption of new revenues, I know in the past, um, I remember even before, on the, on the cusp of the Great Recession, there were discussions of possible types of new revenues. I know some are easily implemented, some take much more are much more difficult to implement. Uh, and so I think as part of this discussion, particularly because we have new members in the council, is understanding what those potential new revenues are. Mind you, every time we talk about them, none of them ever get implemented, but right. just understanding what they are. Real quick, I'll just add, these first couple here, these first four, increase operating efficiencies, reduce personnel expenses, partner and grow the base. This is sort of in our DNA. And the council's been directing this for many, many years, and your staff goes about it daily trying to figure out how to do these things. This is really application of lean concepts. This is uh, uh, the idea of innovating all the time to come up with new ways. The partnering aspect, and the mayor gave a great example of that. This enhanced the revenue base with our general economic development efforts that we've enjoyed successes at over the last couple of years. So this is sort of our bread and butter, and this, frankly, is what has kept us balanced or at a surplus, um, a growing fund balance over the last five or six years. These down here that the mayor just went through are a little bit, um, they require more thoughtful policy making. They are the tougher questions as we move forward. And these are very similar to the issues and strategies that we considered in the 2009-2010 era. Uh, changes to service levels in the onset of the Great Recession uh, frankly, were cuts in specific services, the amount of service we provide or the elimination of certain services. Increasing property tax for operations, I think we had a year or two back in 2010 era 
where we uh, raise property taxes for operations by about uh, $500,000 <coughs> per year. Adjustments to existing revenue sources, as the mayor was talking about, uh, there are many revenue sources that are widely used. We use them as well. Many of them are capped as to what, the, what is the maximum rate by law, what is the maximum rate, and then what is really the effective maximum rate that we can have and still maintain competitiveness uh, with our neighbors. Uh, these really, on this line, are small uh, dollars. Uh, the bigger dollars are, are in the adoption of new revenues, and the, the best way to explain adoption of a new revenue that's uh, been successful at generating money to address an issue that we've done in our recent past is the stormwater utility. That was million, measured in millions of dollars. So uh, I think that adds some, some color here. Uh, when we are in long-range planning mode, uh, we're looking for council thoughts and direction at the 30 and 40,000 foot level. And so we're trying to understand, not just tonight, but through discussion, which of these types of things uh, should remain in the report in its final format that would give us direction as we move forward. So we're not asking anybody to say, well, I want to change this service level here tonight, or I want to raise or, or do this or, or to something to property taxes or new revenues. But just through the interaction of the council tonight, we'd just like to hear a little bit more about what's on your minds and how these should appear, if at all, in the final report that comes out in the August-September time frame. Right. And I think that's important, but it's also important to understand, to some degree, as you've already touched upon, what the materiality threshold is for some of these. So if adjusting existing revenues are, we're talking about pennies, really, then is it something that we should really be addressing, assuming we're looking at converging lines again, which I'm going to assume that's going to happen real soon, uh, even if Springfield doesn't screw around with us further. Uh, so I think in order to have a, and I'm not suggesting we do it tonight, I don't think time permits, um, I think, you know, clearly it would be very easy to say I'd like to partner with others, enhance our revenue base, um, and you know, work with the EDC to increase sales tax, and that will solve all our problems. Uh, but I think for us to make decisions, we need to know whether what kind of impact that would actually have and what time frame, because I know some of these have short horizons, some of these have long horizons. And as I said to each uh, of the council members in the individual meetings that preceded this, is, is, you know, when we were back in 2008 to 2010, it was definitely crisis mode and we had to move in that fashion and we responded appropriately, well thought out and effectively, as you can see here. This is not that same amount of urgency from staff's perspective at this point. We're trying to get ahead of this issue, work on it now so that we have some ability to just keep this in mind as we start talking about strategies we'd like to implement, what discussions we would like to have, and how we go about preparing the 16, 17, 18 uh, year budgets. So uh, these are all important. These are imminent issues. I think you can look at these lines and say it's going to happen if we don't take some of these steps. Uh, but it's certainly not an urgent matter where we're going to go right into some sort of service prioritization at the next meeting as was done in the 2009-2010 era. Dave? Uh, could you, you remind me what the, at our peak, what was our sales tax percentage revenue? As a, as a percentage, uh, at one point in the mid-1990s, 1996 sticks out in my mind, uh, more than half of our general okay, fund well, revenues uh, was 53%. Uh, now we, uh, at our low point, I think it was about 23% of our general fund revenues. We're back up around 24-25%. Okay, and, and, and going back to the good times, uh, when I first came on council, that was good times, but economically good times. Just a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nothing I did specifically, but we, we started talking about uh, uh, strategic planning and that, and we had TCD, and, and the big thing was from the residents and from council was what can we do about certain certain areas, 63rd and Woodward, 75th Street, you know, and some of the others. Uh, yet, as was mentioned, we have these uh, complex arrangements that uh, force us, uh, you know, how long are we going to have to sit there and, and look at those type situations and is there a way to unravel some of this stuff uh, so we can 
negotiate better or have have a better arrangement with those with those particular properties you know work with the owners or you know what are our options maybe we got to start doing planning some specific actions now and, and at the 40,000 foot level I would say that that would be being in support of enhancing the revenue base and working with the EDC to increase sales tax base and sales tax revenue by coming up with solutions for those problems right I, mean, I think that's the level of the discussion tonight but <coughs> you, I agree with you talking about sales tax and keeping this at a high altitude level I think it's a very significant victory for the village that those words are written up there that acknowledging where we were in the 1990s where we were in 2005 and where we are now allows us to understand we, we can study we meaning c collectively what happened because this, uh, this uh, 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 well, what I find is a troubling statistic is if you, if you look at Chicago land as a whole the amount of retail sales in 2014 were 18% higher than they were in 2005 in Downers Grove retail sales are about 3.79% lower than they were in 2005 out of the 50 communities that in 2014 collected the most sales tax we came in 46th out of 50 in terms of comparing 2014 to 2005 there's no magic bullet to solve that there's no nobody made one mistake that let that happen but we need collectively to understand why that happened so we can reverse that trend going forward I have theories this is not the place to bring in it because we're staying at 40,000 feet um, I've discussed this with, with Michael Cassa he has an excellent understanding of how all this works so as far as a strategy for going forward step one remember that Downers Grove when I, I ran the real council in 1992 and at that time huge sales tax revenues what we keep our property taxes low no vehicle stickers no stamp taxes on the, on the sale of homes no ticky tech fees here there everywhere because of sales tax and well just to, to just to create a narrative a very brief narrative I believe that sometime between 2000 and or maybe a little before then we stopped feeding the golden goose that was laying our eggs we stopped to understand what why we had such strong we, and we took it for granted and there's no one person involved but there's lots and, and that we need to reverse the course so, so acknowledging the issue is step one there's plenty of data out there to determine which communities have done well curiously not so curiously perhaps Oswego over the last 10 years has been a phenomenal performer and that's where Michael Casa came from um, <laughs> not Han landlocked Hanover Park Hanover Park went up 224 percent well we went up we went down three percent now there's reasons for all of this and it's not that they're they, they had some ma ma magic bullet but we need to be honest and candid about the numbers and we need to engage everybody to work together collaborate to figure out what to do about it and we need to look at other communities to go with to, to understand what works there what works here just for order or order magnitude if Downers Grove collected eight, uh, 18 percent if the retail sales in Downers Grove in 2014 were 18 percent higher than they were in 2005 which is the Chicago Metro average well it works 155 percent on the yeah and they propose 124 percent if we're 118 percent we'd have 4.5 million dollars more in sales tax revenue than we do that's more than the stormwater utility and that's the structural gap that made the stormwater utility a necessity neglecting the sales tax base created the structural gap gap that made the stormwater utility necessary in the first place um, neglected ne neglect of my, my theory is neglect of sales tax infrastructure the same way we used to neglect our streets and that's how it happened um, and, and and when you start getting in the weeds I got lots of ideas as one place you know but just acknowledging that as a priority and it won't be a fast solution we're not bouncing back in two or three or four or five years but if we want to leave a strong fiscal fiscal position for the council that comes out in five or ten years we need to focus on this now and we need to partner with partner with DDC more EDC in my opinion needs to focus on sales tax revenue 
and their and their performance should be measured on the increase in sales tax revenue. If property tax if, if our property tax levy is going to stay flat, more buildings helps the school districts doesn't help us. It doesn't flow onto our balance sheet straight away. It doesn't flow on the not balance sheet, the revenue side of the equation straight away. Unless we want to adopt new fees, new taxes, traditional sales taxes. Um, will flow most directly onto the revenue side of the equation. And just one final point I said to you is that in many ways, okay, first of all, I am strongly and adamantly opposed to raising the home rules to any form of sales tax rate. If we charge higher sales taxes than our neighbors, we won't get the businesses. They'll go to the neighbors where the taxes are lower. We already, uh, I think the home rule sales tax may be a little too high already from a, from a competitive point of view, but that's why we're at a bridge. We can't change it. So absolutely, under no circumstances do I want to raise the sales tax rate. But if we increase our retail sales base, that's not money coming out of our taxpayer's pocket. People are going to shop the same, whether they shop in Downers Grove or they shop in Lombard, or they shop in Bolingbrook, if they shop in Oak Brook, if they shop in Schaumburg. The level of shopping is going to be the same. And if we, if we don't enhance that base, we need to make up that gap with increased property taxes, increased stormwater utility, all the ticky tack fees that other, other towns charge, I don't want us to charge, or we reduce services. And that's why tasking the EDC with growing the sales tax base, not, it, 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 it won't solve our problems in 16 or 17, but if we want to be, this, if, if, if we want to sustain ourselves um, 10, 20 years out in the future, we do it now. It's my, just one, one last time, it's my understanding of the history that in the early 1960s, they went through a process like this, like we're doing right now, and they very deliberately put shopping malls, retail spaces, on the outskirts of Downers Grove with the very deliberate and conscious intention of getting people outside of Downers Grove to shop at those stores. And that built the golden goose that gave us the golden egg so that in the 1960s, over 50% of our general fund came from sales tax. And it didn't have to come from property tax. And by growing our sales tax base, we're not taking money out of our tax uh, out of the pockets of our residents. We're not. We're getting we're, we're getting more of a share of what's going to be spent, anyways. But I still speak to done. I, Commissioner, I agree with you that our priority uh, should be and has been um, uh, sales tax base. Uh, but obviously, you're well aware of all the challenges that make us very different than Naperville. We've been landlocked. We don't have open space. We're not Bolingbrook. We're not as we go where we can just build big boxes because we have big open fields. We don't have that. Unless we're going to use eminent domain to combine parcels, we can't do it. Um, the, the keys to sales tax base are big box retailers and auto dealers. Uh, we don't have a place in town to put a big box you're, retailer. You're getting too close to the, you're getting too low on the absolute band. I, I don't agree. But, but get, my, my get, point is, I would, not, I would not say, I would say it is a priority. I would not say it's been neglect. I would not agree with that. Um, but I agree with you, it should be a priority going forward. And since the plane usually flies forward, regardless of what, regardless of what altitude it is, we should, we should go forward. I would also disagree that the uh, motivation behind the stormwater utility was to somehow replace sales tax because I was the guy that proposed it, and that was the last thing on my mind. No, I just said that that created the gap where you didn't have the money. If, if the sales tax was there, you wouldn't need yeah, it. Yeah, that's, <coughs> no, that's not at all why I propose it. Okay. I, I mean, just telling you, no, I know that to be a case, and uh, we're in a public meeting, I just want to make sure everyone's got the facts straight. So just to add a little bit of that to, to that, in 2005 era, pre-Great Recession, we did a pretty thorough analysis of some of these very trends and issues. And the summary is we found that we were performing very well and we were collecting dollars from other communities, a net surplus, in three key areas auto sales, electronics, and household and home improvements, which makes sense if you think about the makeup of our major retailers. We were doing very well in these three areas. Where we were leaking, where we were a net exporter of dollars, was in general merchandise. We don't have the big boxes, as the mayor said. We have a lot of challenges with even having the infrastructure in terms of land assets big enough to, to uh, attract and maintain these. Uh, this was pre-recession, and then the recession hit, and if you look at where we were doing well, these three areas were hit very hard in the recession. Coming out of the recession, we've done a real good job in auto sales, and these other two categories are starting to do a little bit better, and I think we have some strong uh, performance here. But there have been some very major changes in how people purchase electronics, broader changes in retailing that affect a lot of us. Um, and the other thing that happened right around the same time frame is that other communities 
like Bolingbroke in their regional mall and improvements to your town in that regional mall. Uh, right outside of us, but within our trade area, we're causing, I think, more leakage in some of these general merchandise areas and some other areas as well. <laughs> so what we envision is that the council says, uh, hey, this is a strategy we'd like to use, work with the EDC. We would go back and sort of relook at the trends and issues, what are they in the modern time frame, and build a, a set of recommendations around this. Um, the other part of the narrative is uh, the amount of economic development focus that we had just to sort of weather that storm uh, in the Great Recession was clearly focused on auto sales and filling existing vacancies, and the list is very long. I'm proud to say that on a parcel for parcel basis, a building for building basis, we've actually filled all those vacancies. So right now we're kind of back to square one. And it seems like a great time to sort of reinvent that project uh, with this as the goal. Just one, one going forward. Yeah, one quick comment, just that everybody sh sh should be aware of. When you have an auto dealership with a 50% sales tax rebate agreement, we get 50% of every. Well, it, it, it's it's 25% of what we would get from general merchandise that paid the 1% state tax <coughs> plus the 1% home rule. Because automobile sales are exempt from the home rule sales tax. So if general merchandise, if 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 a business sells ten thousand dollars in general merchandise, we get four times as much sales tax from that transaction as we would from selling a car that was worth ten thousand dollars. Now cars are absolutely positively an essential part of the puzzle, but that's not but general merchandise is you know that's the, that's the type of stuff though that if you look at the altitude bands. We're dipping down where this not, shouldn't be part of this discussion. I believe we should task the people who know how to do this with answering, and then report to us so that we are kept fully aware of all these details. And because, yeah. Commissioner? Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> I appreciate what Commissioner White did, the, the uh, discussion that, that he's introduced here and, and this item on working with the EDC to increase the sales tax base. I think this is, a, for, from my perspective, um, you know, when I look at the revenue sources and, and the impact that these revenue sources have on people uh, in our community, you know, this is one area where if we can focus on this, this is, this is benefiting both the community without hurting people by raising property taxes and making continuing to make it more and more unaffordable to live in town. I mean, I hear when I was out at Grove Fest or just walking on the street or at you know, at the Fourth of July parade, you know, people talk frequently about property taxes and the unsustainable nature of the property tax. And I think that's you know, it, it, it's it's definitely an issue throughout the state of Illinois but also here in Downers Grove, and I think we've done a great job um, in Downers Grove, uh, especially over the past We're just nine few years. Of the bill. Right, um, to uh, keeping our portion, uh, you know, our portion flat uh, for operations over the past four years, um, five years, I think, perhaps. So this is something that's important uh, to me. You know, I think that as we consider, as we move into an era of more uncertainty and perhaps you know we look at the you know, income tax revenue could decrease significantly property tax revenue from being frozen and we look at some of these more alarming pieces here I think you know then all of these solutions and strategies thing of course all these you know the, these are great and partnering and, and enhancing efficiencies and that but at some point, I think we will need to have some discussion. Uh, if we can't raise our property taxes and sales tax revenue is, we're working on it, but it's not going to it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and you know, income tax revenue is reduced. Then you know, looking at what are the services that we're providing, what are the levels that we're providing it at, is going to be a conversation that we're going to need to have and what can the community support. So th this is an item that, you know, I don't, I don't want to engage in, as managers stated, we don't, we don't need to come in next week and put out a bunch of things and cut a bunch of things we're doing now or 
uh, make those decisions right now. But you know, these are the broader conversations I think is going to be very important to have um, in the long run because these service levels, you know, is this truly going to be sustainable in an environment, in a possible environment where we're, we're under, under enormous pressure from the revenue side. Right. It really ought to be expectations because there's as much pressure um, going the other way to actually Increase do more. Them. Correct. Mm -hmm. What are the community's expectations? On the one hand, you just voiced a concern about it's becoming unaffordable, and yet we hear all the time uh, demands for more services, and they're right. not inexpensive ones. Right. Well, it's, it's the classic predicament. You do everything it, with nothing. Right. I don't, I, don't, I want, you know, fix my street, fix the flooding problem in my neighborhood and make sure that when I call 911 that the police or the fire arrive in, you know, 15 seconds flat, you know, but but I want but I want my property tax to go down. Well, that's just not going to happen. And so where is that balance? And, and I think something that we've you know, we've always stated in, uh, is that we want to maintain and enhance service levels. You know, if we are in a situation, in, a, in an extreme situation, I think that's something we need to at least bring on the table and have a, have a frank and, and candid conversation about. Well, you know me, I'm, I'm Captain Consolidation Cooperation. Absolutely. And get the most bang for your buck in the shortest time horizon. You know, one, one of the things that's really frustrating is, is that as good a job as the village has done keeping the property tax flat, we seem to get the blame. And, and, and you sit there and you say, hey, we're only 10%, we're only 10%. And yet when you get your bill and you go, you know, it's so much larger, and you go down the list of, and everything's going up. So it's kind of like everybody gets their little piece of the pie, and we're trying to remain flat, and yet we're getting the same uh, blowback well, it's, it's the same, yeah, the same amount of grief as there, maybe even more because we're more local. Uh, well, we're we're more so we're more visible, and yeah. if a lot of people were from the city of Chicago, in the city of Chicago, you pay for it's all run through the city. The schools are the city. Of Chicago. <laughs> so. I, I want to talk about the city of operating scopes we have to expect anything less than a 68 percent continual increase in cost of doing the providing those services. No reason at all. Um, best efforts aside, um, you know, there'll be years where that's you know, four and a half and years where it's eight and a half. Um, and it's going to be a function really more than anything of the makeup of our workforce. Their, their longevity levels is what's going to move that up or down in that range of 68 percent growth. Uh, but it is going to grow that. And so if you kept everything else the same, you'd have to take, you'd have to cover 77% of your costs at an additional 6 to 8% rates and like that. So that is a crisis. That uh, I don't think there's that kind of microphone. Well, yeah, I, I don't know it's going to help. So I, I guess I would suggest that I think it is a crisis, and I think we should be looking at it um, not with a, you know, let's cut any particular item for the second six months of this year. Um, but as we go forward into the concept of long range, there's no reason to expect anything but 12%, 14% more costs, the same business we're doing right now in 2017 slash 18. So unless we're prepared to just lay that on property taxes or contract on the hopes that maybe we can talk Target into putting a store in our town, I think we've got to get a little more aggressive with planning, long-range planning, some of those items on the right. I think we've got to, you know, to Dave's point, Martin's point uh, about capital consolidation and, and staff is, those, those top four things are doing and looking for opportunities every time. But I think we need to say, as if we look at the bottom there, the things to consider, I think we need to be giving direction to staff some things that might sound like, hey, plan on, tell us what it looks like with 20% reduction in LGDF every year for the next five years. 
I don't know if that's going to happen. None of us do. But the state obviously is in deep hole and sees that as free money, and they've been talking about it forever. We ought to be thinking about what that looks like. Um, changes to service levels. I, I mentioned that last time we had a meeting because I don't see how we get around that. I mean, maybe we can't be in the business of having an engineering staff. Maybe we can't be in the business of plowing streets. Um, I think, Bill, you mentioned at some point you had the comment about, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to do it, uh, this just, or not do it justice, but of, you know, each of these government entities that's laid on that property tax bill finding their role, the best one, where they fit best and what they do best. And I think we've got to be asking our staff to, to look for things that they think we could do better for others, as well as look for things that they think we can get out of the business of doing. Um, because we can't sit here and say, I, I think we can't sit here and say we're doing a good job of long-range planning if we're not asking to go through those scenarios because we know that these costs are going to run at that rate. And so to hold everything even, you'd have to be raising your taxes 4 or 6% to keep up. And at the same time, to everybody's point, everybody hears that, right? Don't raise my taxes, don't raise my taxes, and, and we're stuck in a box. So we've got to be at least planning. I'd like to see us do some kind of scenario stuff to plan those things. Don't execute on them, but let's understand what they mean. Let's understand what the savings really are. Maybe the savings aren't as great as we think, or maybe the impacts aren't as great, but I think we should be directing our staff to, to actually go through those things. Um, Another thing that I think we should consider doing is some sort of a policy as it relates to pension costs and property tax. Um, those costs, whether we like them or not, we should be paying them and we should continue to pay them. And obviously the law says we should, blah, blah, blah. But those are commitments we've made that whether we like them or wish they were different, we've made them, we got to pay them. And what I'd like us to consider is some sort of a policy that says, for lack of a better description, there's a baseline budget that says we're going to raise property taxes or whatever it takes to cover pensions, even if we experience other operational reductions. I'd like to sort of separate the two a little bit um, from our intentions as it relates to property taxes, because I don't want to get in a spot where we're pulling the plug on a bunch of employees because we got a pension payment we got to do, and we're reluctant on the, on the tax side. It may or may not work to help us describe the situation to the public, but it might. Um, those are commitments we have to do. And, and I, what we've done in the past, we've had some ups and some downs. We've had some offsets, you know, where we've had a pension payment that was due that, that caused us to raise the amount we had to levy for pensions, and we had some offsets in operational costs, and so the pain wasn't quite so bad. There's a little bit of a fool in the public that's going on there. Uh, and I'd like us to consider some sort of reporting accounting policy that ties that separates at the same time ties, property tax, levy rates, and, and pensions. I, I don't want to say to our public that we're uh, we're doing a great job, we haven't raised your taxes, when the truth of the matter is we got an actuarial break in pensions. Uh, I, yeah. I have a technical question about that, and maybe I don't understand correctly, that the portion of the, that, <coughs> the amount that's needed to make the required pension fund is an, is an independent levy. It's a separate line on the tax bill. Right. Yes. And and we routinely just set it at what we need to make the right. contribution. Yes, right. right. And I think aren't we required by law to do that? Yes, we are. So we, we just follow the law and we and we do know, what you say. As it relates to <laughs> as it relates to the other side, but we've we've chosen to try and have total levies as targets that were flat or reduced. Oh, okay. And we so un, we un, benefited un, from some offsets in the operational aspect of things to have a total aggregate that's about the same. So unpin it. Okay, yeah, yeah. We, that, you know, obviously, it's not an answer tonight. I'd like us to talk about that in detail. Um, We've gone we, through periods where there was a stated sort of practice, it was never a policy, that was just we're going to separate them and we're yeah. just going to. With yeah. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. We've also we, gone through periods where we've well, yeah. tried to offset. It's also no secret because it does show up as a separate line item, so anybody can take out their bill from last year and compare them and figure yeah. out what the yeah. real nobody's, deal is. Nobody's doing that. Wait, you're no, we, 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 we have okay. the other one other thing. I'll, 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 I'll go ahead. Well, no, if you're on pensions, go ahead. Well, well, I had to do with pensions and, and, and some thoughts I had. We have been talking for a long time about having designated. Uh, sources of revenue to pay for specific services. So when you talk, when you go to the public and talk water, you can say, you know, City of Chicago plus the Page uh, Water Commission <coughs> plus the 
flat charge that we charge, and our flat charge for the meter is always the same. It's very simple. They can go on. We, you know, we can go through a number of things that we have designated sources of revenue, and uh, on the on the sheet, and I thank thank Dave and, and staff for this. Actually, it's part of the sheet that I wanted uh, in in the packet of the responses today. Uh, what I what I asked for uh, was a spreadsheet that basically uh, took a public service employee, and I was I was thinking that we might take police or a fireman, and you hire them at age you know 25, and what we've been doing is we we kind of manage the first half of their lives, you know, with service levels, you know, response times, contracts, and like, and people pay attention to that. And then when we get into the pension part of it, it's kind of like a rolling of the eyes, and we talk, you know, we we do the, the, the service levels and everything at ground level, but when we start talking about pensions, we're at about 15,000 feet instead of the 30, and, and we kind of roll around those numbers. And what I was thinking of is, you know, if you have 150 employees, you know that on day one, they're starting out at 56,000, and it's on here. But then you see, as time goes on, for the next 30 years, they're an active employee. They're providing services. They're they're saving lives. They're catching bad guys. You know, whatever they do, they do that for 30 years, and then they drop off into the red zone where they collect these pensions that continue to go up. And and we talk about that in general terms, and not specifically. And so uh, what I asked was, you know, this this would be a look at let's say one employee. And at the end of, you know, you look at the phenomenal amount of time, uh, uh, money and the raises and so forth, and uh, it seems like when we hire a rookie cop, uh, we essentially are promising to shell out $2 million. Not 55000 but $2 million because of all the raises. They work for 30 years, and for the last 30 years, they're on pension. And it's not just them, it's also their spouse, because if one of them passes, if the uh, pensioner passes away, the spouse gets 50%. So you're going to about pay, uh, 85 or beyond. And I think the public and, and us, you know, we ought to be looking at when you hire somebody new, you're, you're making a commitment, a $2 million commitment. And so, you know, and, and Dave and I were fooling around with numbers, and I says, you know, 2 million bucks. Uh, let's see, we divide it, put it all on the property tax. Okay, we sent everybody a bill for eighty dollars. Doesn't sound like much, eighty bucks. We get a new cop for eighty bucks, except we have that. Except we have a between the police and fire, we have one hundred and fifty. Send that bill out. So, what I was thinking was, and and if, and if uh, Dave would get me the numbers. Because we have one employee who started here at, at, at one. We have a number of employees that are, uh, you know, in your year 13, year 15. If you get me those, I'd be happy to plug them in. And, 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 and so maybe we, we budget for uh, a certain amount of money, uh, say $100, $200 million uh, at the end of the line. And as people drop off, for lack of a better term, maybe you adjust service levels. Okay, you can't get another you can't get another rookie until you know you have the budget. You can't get another rookie until we meet you know until uh, the numbers work out. We'll say. So the good news about what Commissioner Waldack is talking about this this idea of considering the lifetime costs of an employee and aligning with your revenues for planning purposes. We just heard our auditors say that GASB 67 and GASB 68 are forcing that conversation on every public entity. And what he was talking about was exactly what Commissioner Waldeck just said. It's taking the actuarial studies from the pension funds, putting them into your CAFR and saying, hey, look, here are the unfunded liabilities, or what are the things they're calling them now, net liabilities, putting them out there and forcing this conversation. Now, the good news is we've been having this conversation at various levels for decades, and we've been cognizant of this issue. We've been making all of our pension payments. We've been doing some great planning. But this exact concept here is tying the actuarial, actuarial reports to the unfunded liabilities and state mandates and 
really bringing it into the fold of how are those lines going to work out? How are we going to pay the lifetime cost of the employee? So that is coming, and we can get you those actuarial reports. They're available, and we can show everybody how, you know, in next year's CAFR, that number will be on there, and it will be part of the discussion. So just to go off this topic, if we're talking about pensions, pensions, the, the amount of the pension is something that's out of our control. Set by the state. Set by the state. The amount of benefits on a per employee basis are out of our control in that the benefit levels and the contributions are set by the state. Right. There's only two things in our control really as it relates to pension calculation. The number of people we have employed at any given time right. and the amount that we choose to pay them. Right. Yeah, no, I think, but I think it's worth high, highlighting and repeating and you know, I think it's been said before this meeting, but that is something that's at the state level and that's something that's required uh, you know, that we're not setting. So as Bob correctly pointed out, those, those two are the levers that we have. Bob, what, what was the second one, that we have a choice of what we pay them? Yes. We, that, that's part, it ends up being do we really? <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. We, 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 if, if, you, if you hire somebody, you have a contract. Well, right. And we negotiate and so those if contracts. You negotiate it, but then they don't strike. So we come up with, okay, we'll pay you this, but you don't you don't get a raise. They want a six percent, and you wind up going into arbitration. And it isn't like zero and six divide by two. Okay, everybody gets a three. It's winner take all. And so we're kind of stuck with those rules too, is what I'm getting at. So well, yeah, we've we avoided we've totally avoided that though, and and we've avoided that because we've had employees who've been trying to be a cooperative part of the process and understand the challenge. But but our pay rates, there's only, the only two things are our pay rates, which are you know ours vary compared to other communities, and the number, the number of people we have. Number uh, and that, that's why the that's why the service level discussion is one that I think I, I would suggest is more of a crisis. It has to be talked about in more serious detail and over the coming months. In what do we want to actually seriously talk about? I mean, significant changes. Like, are we going to not be in the business of engineering any of our own work? Are we going to not be in the business of fighting fires? Are we going to not possible? I think we need to have those conversations and see what it looks like. Outsourcing. Well, or or, or, some or, work, or working with partnerships, yeah. I mean, See, I, we, the work's still got to get done by somebody. Yeah, yeah, Dave, Dave and I had talked yeah. about, yeah. you know, suppose we announce we're not going to fight fires anymore, so now we dump it on the county. In the meantime, as Dave put it up, our insurance costs are going to go through the roof. Things are going to burn down, or probably we're more, more in the paramedic business than, than actual fires, so response times are going to be terrible and people aren't going to accept it. And if you dump it over on, let's say, a county or township or whatever, people are going to demand more service, and they're going to wind up in the same position anyway, having to pay pensions right. and all right. that. So, so you haven't gone anywhere. My choice of words was probably not great. No, 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 that was, that, that was fine. I mean, you know, that's, I, that's one thing. I, the other thing is privatization. And, and if you talk privatization, well, now, now you got rid of the pension costs, but now you're in a profit center, and we all know what happens to your health care when everybody wants to, you know, do you really want that pain pill on the way to the hospital? You know, uh, you're, you're going to pay through the nose for it, so, and, and you're not going to get the level of service, so. When we did the, kinda when we did the 911, you could argue that Westmont said they were getting out of the business of taking 911 calls. It was probably a bad choice of words on my part no. to describe no. it that way, but that's what I mean mm -hmm. when I talk about that. The, the, um, one more thing I wanted to talk about that's not related to pensions or payroll or personnel. Um, but I don't think we can get away with, although everybody in the room is probably going to want to, the idea of talking about the general fund, schedule's gone, and being done talking about the general fund without talking about stormwater utility. Oh, they're tied together. It's because we're not done with the general fund if anybody sitting at this table thinks we're going to pull the plug on the stormwater utility because it's a whole different thing. Martin made that point in the meeting. And he, you know, I mean, it's, we can't get around that. If, if we're seriously going to do that, this conversation is not going to be over until we finish the next conversation about infrastructure. It's a what, four and a half, six million dollar proposition mm -hmm. as it stands right now. 
you know, they're definitely interrelated and they're very tightly interrelated. Um, I, I do want to talk briefly about the changes in service levels <coughs> that <coughs> as elected representatives, if, if we you know to have that conversation, I, I believe we are strongly obligated to find a very widespread way of community engagement to make sure that, I mean, I, I don't think, for example, a single survey would give us anywhere near the type of, of detail to make a decision. I mean, the surveys are part of the picture, but but we would need, I would want to know that our residents understand how their lives will change with reduced service levels before we decided to go that way. Can I just interject for a second, and then I want to give both Gina and Greg an opportunity to say something because they haven't had a chance to say anything yet. There's actually a tool that I saw demoed at uh, National League of Cities once upon a time. It's literally a slider scale. The resident can get on, and by moving around dollars and service levels, they can see exactly what happens if they change their service levels. Uh, in fact, when I saw it, it was, I think, uh, beyond beta test mode, it's probably more sophisticated now. But if you feed it with the right information based upon what your community actually does, uh, you can allow residents to literally say, well, I don't want to pay more than this. Well, then all these other things move around. Oh, well, I don't want that. And then you move it around. And you get to a point where it's not a survey. If you're right, if you ask a survey question, you're going to get a bunch of information back that's not going to be helpful. I want something for nothing. Well, I, I want everything done, and I don't want to pay anything for it. Right. That's what everyone's reaction is going to be. That's, that's but really it's like actually it. a very interesting tool when you see it applied, because someone can literally start to move the slider scale around uh, to try to achieve their preferences, but they see immediately how that impacts the other preferences and service levels. Now, it's something that I think Dave and I talked about some time ago. Put um, on the website. So if you're going to have that thing, it's, it's literally the best way to see immediately, oh, I get it. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. It's like Sin City with four dollars. Yes. <laughs> but do you think people will actually do that? I mean, would people. Well, it's also fun to play with. So yes, you're sort of drawn to it. Cause you so how do you how do you get an entire? I, I want to pay half the tax I'm paying right now, and you that. find out there goes your response time. Well, Dark for sixty correct. seconds for True Life yeah. True Life story that hits this point exactly from District 99. When I was president of District 99, they consolidated bus service with 58, 68, 99. Saved several hundred thousand dollars. Every, in the spring, everybody was all excited. This is wonderful. Well, the level of service fell, and we practically got hung up from lampposts <laughs> because of the way the bus, the level of bus service was so bad. Parents said, I don't care how much it costs. I want, I want good bus service. So in the spring, cut, 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 we're spending too much money. In the fall, when they learned what the level of service cut actually meant to their daily lives, you can't cut that. So that's the, that's the reality check, and ultimately we can't make one plus one equal three. The community needs, needs to understand we make one plus one equal two, and we the, the seven of us vote. But ultimately we're supposed to reflect their informed understanding of, of what of what the community chooses. So before we cut service levels, I'm going to want a lot of proof that that's really what 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 the majority of the community truly wants and 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 and, and, and they're not just given a sort of the knee jerk oh, of course i want lower taxes i want lower taxes but <coughs> there's no such thing as a free lunch you get what you pay for and if you know and if we cut service levels i i i'd, I'd want to make sure that everybody knew how that was going to affect their daily lives so that they're making a truly informed choice. And that's why I drew these arrows to this partnership concept and the service levels because what we've learned and we've had similar experiences in all of our backgrounds is that it's preferable to garner economies of scale and enhance the service levels or at least keep them about the same to get the cost savings before we actually change the service delivery. And so we've been working really hard on that. These are so interrelated that you kind of have to approach them with the same mindset at the same time. Gina, Greg, well, I just, unless you want to go? Go ahead. Now, I, I think what we're seeing here is that you've got the, the long range uh, items that are less painful and the more short term options are much more painful. To Bill's point, we, it, we will probably have to have a discussion on service levels at some point if these things take place on a state level. Uh, and perhaps even if it's just the cost increases that continue, as, as Bob talked about. Um, but we do need to have tremendous community engagement on that. Uh, I know that's something that this staff and council excel at, and, and I have complete confidence in that. Um, obviously, we want to work with the EDC to increase the sales tax base. I, I've yet to meet a municipal official that uh, doesn't like sales tax. 
um, that means the economy is going well, it means that your town is doing well. Um, that said, as uh, the mayor has uh, famously said, at least back in 2011, there's no economic development easy button. Oh. Um, I was going to say that tonight. You beat me to it. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, I took that one from you. But uh, it, it's a, another one of those long-range plays. Uh, we've had some successes over the last four or five years. Uh, I think we continue to, but um, it gets more and more challenging because of the infrastructure challenges. And I don't know that anybody's got the stomach for the more extreme measures that the mayor alluded to earlier. Um, I know that's another thing that we would need tremendous community engagement on. Um, so I think that uh, brings me back to the, the partnerships, public and private, uh, exploring those to the nth degree, uh, but also uh, to touch on something that, that Bob uh, used, I think, an apt phrase, uh, free money. The state is treating income tax revenue, the property tax freeze, et cetera, as that normally would come to us as free money. Um, I would probably phrase it a little differently in that they're trying to take their problem and make it ours. Uh, which I think is a not very good way of making policy. But um, that, that's why I think in the near term we need to continue to very strongly monitor and do everything we can to protect village revenues. Um, I think we all know an elected official or maybe a dozen in Springfield who were previously municipal elected officials. Um, and I think if they were sitting in these chairs rather than in those chairs, they would feel very differently differently about a property tax freeze or uh, income tax revenue cuts. And did. And did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it's all by way of saying that there, and there are options uh, in Springfield, and who knows what they're going to do. But uh, I think we need to exercise whatever um, soft power we have on uh, Springfield in order to make sure that uh, we protect these to keep our options available to us because I think the, the worst possible scenario is losing a portion of the income tax, the LGBF, freezing property taxes and then all of a sudden we have to have a very tough conversation on changes to service levels uh, because unless we go down the road of raising the sales tax, which I don't think is uh, palatable to anybody, um, we don't have another option. So, Originally I'm rate would probably, yeah. I think it's absolutely counterproductive. Yeah, um, yeah we, we need to keep an eye on the, and keep our hands near all of these letters. Two words I concur. Uh, you know, you put my initials next to that PDC thing. Everybody else is up there. I don't want to be left out. Um, <laughs> I'm you know, I, I, we need to find money. So, you guys need to do that. I would, check the, I would check the village couch cushions. Simple as that. Um, Baker, shut up a look. Nobody wants to increase property taxes for operations, but you know, since I'm the only non politician here, I'm not a lifer. I'm okay with increasing property tax for operations. Uh, where else are we going to get the money? Where is it coming from? The state doesn't allow us to do it. It's freeze. It's not happening. Yeah. Can we create fees, though? It's a whole real community, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about specific, you know, we'll do the gas tax and the telecommunications fee and that. I'm talking about a whole new fee based on when the state takes this much, we want that money in fees. And well, that, that's what I was asking earlier as a reminder to everybody as to what, the, what those might be. There are some that without getting into the 10,000 foot level. There are some that can be done rather well to easily. There are some that require other measures, but uh, uh, it's probably worth as part of the discussion everyone just seeing what they are, not suggesting they're going to put them into place, but just understanding what they are. Uh, but, and, and here's the thing I will point out, again, just to make an observation. It may have been one perspective back when there were other options available. If those options are being slowly taken away for whatever reason, the state or the community desires, then suddenly uh, you know, it's, it's like squeezing the balloon. It's got to go. It's got to go somewhere. That's a pretty natural progression. That if revenue sources that we traditionally depended on uh, aren't available to us or they're shrinking because of state action, uh, the push to fee-based systems is a pretty obvious discussion point. And call it a state a state theft. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> that makes I call it something else, but I'll stay <laughs> polluted. What 
All right, so to, to leave the philosophical for a second and get back to what direction you're looking for from this meeting, um, I, I think you know, there are obviously some things on there that everyone is naturally uh, going to gravitate to because they're less painful than other things. Uh, the EDC Easy Button, partnerships, consolidation. If you make them happen, they're great. And it kind of solves the problem. Um, but I think I, I agree. I think service levels are in, are tied up in all of that. And, and what that means, uh, it, it, to me, it really means community expectations. Back to the slider scale. So what we well, are we talking about TCD three or TCD four in reverse, where we tell them rather than they tell us. No, that never works. And then too they well. and then they tell us. We tell them, too. and then they tell us. That doesn't work too well. So what we so what are you, what are you, what are you looking for from us tonight, Dave? We we've uh, we have the direction we need. Let me explain what we're going to do with what we heard tonight. First of all, we heard uh, discussion points around all of these items, and I didn't hear any of them come off the board. So that is affirmation that at least at the understanding we have now, they're still in play. The second thing I heard and we heard is that we're going to add a couple to the list that we will put for the, the next draft of the report for consideration further. These lifetime costs, uh, some scenario planning exercises that are related to services, and uh, consider a specific policy regarding tax levies and pension costs and how it relates to state laws and other operations. Third thing we're going to do is when we give you the next draft of this report later, uh, probably in the August time frame, is we will actually provide more meat on the bones so that there are explanations and yep. examples so that people know and can understand, well, if it's this, how this is described, this is what it could mean. And so those are the three things we'll take out of tonight's meeting. And I would add to that, when we say maintain strong fund balance, what's the rationale behind what we currently do? Because obviously this is something that's been discussed for at least the last decade, and it's one of those things that we heard the General Assembly and others in Springfield say, well, you got this great fund balance, you're fine, we can take your free money. Uh, but why do we have what we have, what's the rationale behind it, and to the, to the uninitiated, uh, what, 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 just making sure that doesn't look like, well, why are you keeping that when you could use it for these other things? Right. Yeah, uh, it's it's just not more complicated than it might appear on its face. I think for us and the public, it would be, uh, as part of the next round, we'll do. advisable to include What's the reason behind what, what we've been doing in well, that regard? And what we currently have and how it's appropriate because you know, we just saw with the College of DuPage well, yes. that became an issue. Yes. Now why, why is it set at what it's set at? And if it changed, what implications would that have? Back to the slider scale because if you start changing it, that has other implications. We'll do that to the before things. We'll uh, uh, better explain all those rationales and the connections. And that's a right. great segue. The next meeting that we have planned is a pretty detailed discussion on infrastructure and facilities, including the stormwater uh, utility. And I say detailed in a sense that I think we'll still be at the 30 and 40,000 foot level. But there are six major systems we're going to talk about. We're going to try to get through it in one night. It's a lot for anybody to take in. So uh, at that point, we'll, we should be able to make the very real connections between what's going on in the general fund and our options here and what's going on in our five or six major infrastructure systems. Well, okay. uh, well that we get an opportunity here if you guys pretty easily provide us one. Stormwater is right now funded out of its own fund, but there's, I suspect there's quite a few general fund funded activities that we are still not doing what it is that we think from a technical standpoint we should be. Um, facility maintenance is certainly one of them, there's probably others. And so I guess one thing I'd like to get we're trying to understand is the general fund. If it's ten dollars right now, what are we really thinking <coughs> about operating at if we were up to because you know we're still catching up, I think. We're fairly caught up on streets. We've got a plan for stormwater, but we're near fund. Yeah, so and the facilities maintenance aspect of the general fund burden is one that I think we should understand better. I'd like, to, I'd like to have some information on that. Well, the good news is the report is almost finished and it has all those things in it. You'll <laughs> see in each system a recommended level of service or the standard that we're trying to achieve. The current level of service, how are we doing? Is there a gap? Right. How it's funded, and if there's a gap, how, how many dollars is the gap? Where the slider scale currently and, is. And so there is a slider scale component to the infrastructure. Uh, what's interesting is if you look back, uh, we've been very deliberate 
in the infrastructure and utility facility world about saying this is the standard and here's where we are and we have this discussion all the time. We provide over 300 services and most of them are in the general fund and very few of them do we ever have that amount of deliberate conversation about where exactly is the targeted service level and where exactly are we. Uh, so that I think comes into play if we go further down this road. Are we going to sort out stormwater next, next time? I know where I stand. Well, I, <laughs> I know. We should. I mean, I th we should need to. We need to. Right? Yes, I, I agree with you 100%. Yes, we got we got to we got to resolve that because uh, if, if it's something other than what it currently is, it, that gets a lot worse. A lot worse. And those connections will be described in the in the next report. Yeah. We'll pause for public comment. Gordon. You don't even have to get up. Thank you. Well, I uh, find that I can speak better if I'm standing. Um, I was going to uh, talk a little bit about a topic that uh, I raised in council meetings, and you said it was appropriate for long-range planning meeting. That uh, we're now thinking we're going to have a fair number of conceptual uh, matters related to our development zoning um, and uh, I suggested several times during the last year that the community is poorly served by not having a director of community development a senior person and having the mayor or the manager who does have a very important background in community development but uh, even more important responsibilities for the economic welfare of the community uh, playing that role at the present time and we had a good discussion at the council meeting today about the uh, community development issues that are on the table uh, for the council to review and I, when we made the comprehensive plan we had a very good community development director but he still needed outside experts in zoning and uh, community planning. Uh, we're now without a community development director. So as you look at the changes in service levels, I was pleased to see that the manager suggested we weren't looking to reduce the staff, but I think we should rebalance the staff. And uh, there are certain very obvious problems that have come up as we've gone through this difficult period and I think one of the serious ones that needs to be addressed is the need for senior management in the community development department. So I'm hoping that uh, as a follow-up to this meeting and as the manager looks at changes in staff levels that's one of the issues that he'll address. The second uh, issue that I want to bring to your attention and I think should be addressed in the follow-up communication is the health of the TC, uh, the um, TIFs. TCFs, yes, the TIFs. In particular, the maturity of the downtown TIFs and what the stability and ability to get through that is otherwise there's a very substantial implication to the general fund and the health of the village generally if that gift is not going to be uh, ended gracefully uh, we should also get a sort of health report on the Ogden Avenue and the other gifts that are either in place or being considered for the community as a part of this long-range planning effort and I, I'm disappointed not to have seen that mentioned yet so um, those are the issues that I wanted to bring to your attention tonight thank you let me give a quick mention on those two uh, <coughs> uh, the good news is that we uh, that they're not here and the reason they're not here is they're not um, at the level that we think rises to a concern so what you'll see then is some more detailed information on the specific performance of both of those districts in the joint review board meetings coming up July 20th, July 20th. and of those thousand of those reports out yet I can't remember mm -hmm. 
So those reports are on the website. Dr. Goodman will get you the links. Um, and uh, we've seen some positive trends uh, with development activity driving the health, of financial health of the downtown TIF, and that's reflected in those reports. Thank you for those questions and comments. Any other questions or comments? Please. Um, just one comment about, uh, <coughs> I call it a thought relative to sales tax revenue and um, some of the comments I heard about lot size restrictions, you know, difficult to put plant a Walmart down when, if you don't have the uh, geography uh, for it. But um, <coughs> the Walmarts of the world, the targets of the world actually are realizing the same problem problem. They can't continue to grow at the rate they have because there aren't enough locations. And so most of them, uh, Walmart for example, uh, has have uh, and Target both have smaller format stores. Uh, I think Walmart Express, Target Express, on the grocery side uh, there's Whole Foods 365 concept. There, I think there's several Aldi's but I don't think there's one in Downers Grove. I could be wrong. Kind of limited assortment. Uh, grocery store, but these are small footprint, high volume um, retailers. Um, it, they may take up the space of a drugstore, but take up, do 10 or 12 times the business. And um, I don't know if we're, uh, we fit their criteria, but to the extent uh, as they're exploring those new formats, we can make ourselves attractive to them. It may be a way of, you know, four or five of those can start to make up. Uh, start to add up to the equivalent of a big box or so. Just just thinking out loud for what it's worth. No, good point in that uh, is understood and is, has been explored. Now, so getting down to the 5,000 foot level, there's actually other things that go into the mix, but I, yes, should we'll continue to be that. I'm sure of it. But yes, we'll continue to be explored. Good point. Any other comments at this point? Please. I'll make a couple of comments. I, I guess the general reaction is it feels like a lot of this is close, trying to close the barn door after the horse has escaped. Um, the pension situation, if in fact the state determines that, uh, is a subject that should have been assessed, say, 10 or 15 years ago, rather than like the state is attempting to do now, scramble to catch up for what wasn't done previously. Uh, similarly, I'm struck at hearing the idea that you're hoping to rely on sales tax because I would say that based on what I'm hearing so far, um, the expectation is a lot more optimistic than what I think is realistic uh, in terms of accessing any of these sorts of things. Um, and But speaking about the sales tax, I'm intrigued that there's conversation about sharing uh, what you call partnering with others in terms of providing services, but I don't hear conversation talking about partnering with others in terms of sharing revenue. Um, if we know that people are shopping all over the place, uh, maybe I'm naive to assume that um, it would be inappropriate to expect that the areas that are benefiting from that shopping would be willing to share revenue back. Uh, I don't know when you were talking about leakage versus getting revenue from other places through oil sales and that sort of thing, how accurate that is, but it just strikes me that if the notion is that you can't control where people are shopping, it would be natural for the political entities to be talking about how you share those costs rather than imagining what you're really trying to do is be clever and say, oh, well, we won't have to raise the property tax because we'll pick up that revenue from sales tax. That strikes me as uh, a somewhat self-deceptive form of uh, responsibility, if you will. If, if the idea is that you have these expenses, if you're going to claim you're responsible for them, you, you cover their costs. You don't imagine that you're going to try to figure out a way to have someone else cover their costs. But I guess the general concern I have is that, uh, yeah, these lines are going to cross, but I think if we're imagining that the last few years have been uh, indicative of what we see coming in the, in the next few years, I, I feel a lot more comfortable 
expecting that we're going to see a, a replay of the Great Recession or something much more uh, dire, possibly. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Other comments, questions? I come out, we can't end on a gloomy note. <laughs> <laughs> Realistic. <laughs> thank you. See, we didn't end on a gloomy note. Realistic note. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate everyone uh, sticking around for the discussion. Uh, obviously, to be continued as we move to the next phase of this, which is next week, following our regularly scheduled council meeting. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. We are adjourned. Thank you and good night.